Nadev and Avi who are considered Bnei Beisai of the Rebbein Nishalayla. They're considered family members. They're considered people who were raised in the home, as he will say in a moment. Moshe will say, Hashem said, Bikroi Kadesh, I will be sanctified through those who are closest to me. Somebody who grows up in a home feels the proper ethic, experiences what's appropriate behavior, knows in his very guts what is right and what is wrong. He doesn't have to be told. He's not a technocrat who has to be told this is right, this is wrong. He feels it, it's in his very blood and his gut, so they are expected to know what is proper behavior, even if they were not told explicitly. That is what Rashi is explaining through these words, Shahoyalai ben Bayis. And yet, the question still irks us. If they weren't commanded, even if they should have known it, why were they punished so severely? And for this, Rashi has to quote the name Rabbi Shmuel. The Gemara says in Chulin Daf Mem Tes Amid Aleph, Rabbi Shmuel was a koyin. There's an argument there for some who Shmi Abnei Yisrael v'Ani Avarachem. If Ani Avarachem is referring to the Jewish people or referring to the Kayan. V'ani Avarachem, I will bless the Jews or I will bless the Kayan. And Rabbi Shmuel says it refers to the Kayan. And the Gemara says there, Kahana Messiah Kahan. Rabbi Shmuel was a Kayan. He wasn't only a Kayan, he was a Kayan Gadol. The Kayan helps the Kayan. Rabbi Shmuel is the fan of the Kayanim. That's his family. It's who he is. He supports the Kayanim. Full force. So Rabbi Shmuel has a choice. Vani Avarache means I'll bless the Israelites or I'll bless the Kayanim. Rabbi Shmuel says I'll bless the Kayanim. Rashi says there a Lashon in Chul and Daph Memtes. Tamidu Oizronu Meikalem. He always helps them and makes it easier for them. So once we know Rabbi Shmuel is the one who said it, we understand. Kana Messiah Kani. Rabbi Shmuel wants to support Nadav and Aviyu. Nadav and Aviyu are Kayanim. They're the first Kayanim after Aaron. Family. Rabbi Shmuel needs to support Kayanim Kana Messiah Kani. So that's why Rabbi Shmuel, when he has a choice, either I demonstrate that the sin of the Kayanim of Nadav and Aviyu was much less, it was much lighter than everybody thinks. Even though I have to say that at the expense of having a difficulty in the Psukim, he'd rather choose that path than choose another path, an explanation which increases their sin even though it makes the Psukim more smooth. So you're right, according to the Bishma, you have a question, if they weren't commanded, why were they punished this way? But it's easier for Rabbi Shmuel, he prefers saying that they violated something that they were not commanded upon, and hence diminishes the severity of their sin, rather than saying like Rabbi Lezer, that they violated a sin, even though the Pasuk may be a little smoother. And yet, Rashi doesn't feel comfortable only with the explanation of Rabbi Shmuel. Why? The Pasuk does say, Vayakrivu Eish Zara. They offered an alien fire, Asher which means that in the very offering itself, there was something alien, there was something sinful. According to Rebbe Lazar, it's clear. Because the very offering was done in the presence of Moshe Rabbeinu without consulting him, without his consent. So that very offering, although it had a positive quality, the offering itself, but the very offering also had a negative quality. Asher Lloyd Siva Oysam, he didn't command them. Moshe never told him to do it, and they didn't ask him. Fine. But according to Rabbi Yishmael, there was nothing wrong in the offering itself. It was just the state of mind that they were drinking. They were intoxicated. So there's a problem with the words Vayakrivu Lifnei Hashem Eish Zara. There's something alien in the flame. That's one major problem. Another major problem with Rabbi Shmuel is since there was no sin in the very offering, why does the Pasuk 
tell us, and why were they punished through Vatetse Eish? According to Rabbi Shmuel, it's Mida Keneged Mida. They offered fire in an inappropriate way, so fire came out and that consumed them. According to Rabbi Shmuel, the fire wasn't the inappropriate element. The drinking was, so why was the result fire, and why does the Pasuk specify it? And that's why Rashi feels that after everything said and done, Rabbi Lezer's explanation makes more sense in the literal flow of Psukim, and that's why he says that first, but because of the difficulties in Rabbi Lezer, he also gives us the second explanation of Rabbi Shmuel. Which this covers the Rashi al peep shat, the literal interpretation of the Rashi. But now, let's take it to the next level, and that is the deeper lessons that we could derive from this Rashi. <coughs> and here the Rebbe presents an hol- a holistic explanation that encompasses the three layers in Rashi here. The opinion of Rebbe Lezer that they passed away because they said a halach in front of Moshe. The opinion of Rebbe Shmuel that they passed away because they went into the Beis HaMikdash intoxicated. And the third part of Rashi, Moshe Lamelech Shahoyolei Ben Bayis V'chulu Kedhi'isa B'vayikri Rab. The first thing we learn from this Rashi is the sensitivity that is so necessary in the relationship between a student and a Rebbe. Nadav and Avihu's level was tremendous. Moshe is going to say about them, B'kroi v'yakadosh, and Rashi says, the Moshe told Aaron him, G'doylim mimeni u'mimcha, they're greater than me and you. They're greater than Moshe Rabbeinu spiritually, and they're greater than Aaron, and that's why Hashem calls them Kreivai. And yet, they were punished, and with such a severe punishment, because the lack of appropriate bittel, the lack of appropriate humility that they needed to demonstrate in front of Moshe Rabbeinu, that Hayru Allah Befanov, they had the audacity to present Allah in the presence of Moshe Rabbeinu, Notwithstanding their spiritual greatness, <coughs> this caused them to pass away. And this we see in the words of Rebelezer and in who Rebelezer was. Notwithstanding that Rebelezer's power in Teda is so great. He tells us in the Gemara in Brach, as we quoted earlier, that somebody who says something that he didn't hear from his Rebbe causes the Shechina to depart from the Jewish people. So you might ask why. He said his own novel idea. He said something, but yet what Rebbe Lezer is telling us is that with the relationship with the Rebbe is not present, it doesn't only affect the person individually, it affects the Shechina, Shetestalik Mi Yisrael, the Shechina is, so to speak, expelled from Israel. <coughs> Sometimes, there are people that say, What do I need a Rebbe for? I'm a Talmud Chachem, I'm a Lamdin, I need to know Allah, I have a Gemara, I have Paiskim, I have Tur, I have Rambam, I have Shulchan Aruch. If it's a Allah in Yerushalayim, I have Sifri Musa, I have Chavis Alavavis, and I have other Sifri Musa. I don't need a Feltim Nishkin Rebbe, I don't need a Rebbe. I have the Rebbe Nishalayim, I have Hashem Yisbar, the creator of the whole world who gave us the Teda and Art Sinai. And Einoid Mulvadei Lechayir, there's nobody about Hashem, and there's me. What do I need a Rebbe? Comes Rashi and says, Kfar It already happened once, there was not even a view. And they were Kroivai. They were very close. And they were G'daylum Imeniyu Mimcha. And you're not going to have somebody who's greater than not even a view. And Rashi says, you should know, their entire sin was Loi Mesu. The only reason they passed away is Eloi Deishahiru Allah Chibifnei Meishirabu. 
because in the presence of Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe was there, and yet they felt that they could become autonomous. They felt that they can develop their own Yiddishkeit. They felt that they can be independent of Moshe Rabbeinu. I, Moshe, is there, go over to Moshe Rabbeinu and say, Moshe, what should we do? Moshe might say, go ahead. Moshe might say, not go ahead. But the point was not what Moshe would answer. The point was their experience. That their experience was that even though Moshe Rabbeinu was there, in their own mind, in their own perception, they could be independent of Moshe Rabbeinu, and they could chart their own course in life. I want to become close to Hashem. I want to be intimate with Hashem. So why go and I bring Torahs? The Rechaim says in Parshas Achim Mois in the beginning, that Nadav and Aviyu essentially wanted to kiss God. That's is what he says. They wanted to have intimacy with the Rebbe Nishalai. Moshe might be there, but I want intimacy. And they were on the level that they were shy to intimacy. And the Rechaim says, it's happened. They had intimacy and they were kissed by God and they passed away, they expired. And yet we lamented because there was Hayru Allah Bifnei Moshe Rabbah. They were missing. On some level, this Yisoyed, this foundation, that Anoichi Oimeid Beineichum Ben Hashem Lagid Lachem Ezvar Hashem. Hashem appointed Moshe Rabbeinu, I stand between you and Hashem to communicate with Hashem. Vayaminu ba Hashem ava Moshe Avda izak de mechilta. If you argue with Moshe Rabbeinu, kilu chaylek al hashchina. I Moshe Rabbeinu is a human being. Vosayt kilu chaylek al hashchina. But Hashem appointed Moshe Rabbeinu that through him he communicates with Hashem. So when other than Avi want to become close to Hashem, they must ask the Rebbe. So it comes Rebbe Lezer. Rebbe Lezer is Luchis Abriz. Rebbe Lezer is Luchis Abriz. He is Teda. And the stone he's sitting on is Harsinai. So he's a Moshe Rabbeinu himself. So you come to Rebbe Lezer and you say, what's your opinion? Zak to Rebbe Lezer. If Oymer Dovash L'Shama Meraboy, Garam L'Shchina Shetestalik Yisrael. Which according to this, you saw the Rebbe explain the Gemara Menachas. It's a very difficult Gemara in Masechta Menachas that have Chavtesam at base <coughs> about Matan Teira. It says when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to the mountain, to the heavens, he saw that Hashem was sitting and he was designing the Ksarim Laosius. He was designing the crowns on top of the letters of the Sevetera. There are seven letters that have little crowns on them. They're called Tagin. So he asks Hashem, What's the purpose of this? So Hashem told him there's going to be one day a Jew, his name is Akiva ben Yosef. Sha'asid literally shall call kites for kites, tilin tilin shall halachis. On each one of these little lines, these little crowns, Akiva ben Yosef is going to expound mountains upon mountains of halachis. So Moshe Rabbeinu tells Hashem, Hareyuli, show him to me. So Hashem says, fine, Chazayla Achirecha, look backwards. And suddenly, the tape recorder of history was forwarded many generations, and Moshe Rabbeinu finds himself sitting in the base Medrash, in the lecture hall, Rabbi Akiva is giving a shir, he's giving a presentation to his students, and Moshe Rabbeinu is, sits down at the end of 18 rows. And Rabbi Akiva is lecturing, and Moshe Rabbeinu is listening. Moshe did not know, did not understand what is being said. <coughs> His power weakened. He felt terrible. He didn't understand. At one point, Rabbi Akiva arrived at something. Amrulai Talmud of his students said, Rebbe, me nayin lach. How do you know this point? Amar <coughs> lahen Rabbi Akiva said, Halacha l'Moshe b'Sinai. This is a halacha that was received and transmitted from Moshe Rabbeinu from Sinai. Nisyash v'daytoi. Moshe Rabbeinu's mind calmed down. He was now content. Earlier he was profoundly perturbed. Toshash koychoi. Now Nisyash Vadaita. Now he was content. 
This is the story. This story <coughs> requires a lot of explanation. Moshe Rabbeinu wants to see Rabbi Akiva and wants to hear. He doesn't understand what Rabbi Akiva is saying. He gets upset. Why did he get upset? Because he, because he didn't understand. Why Tashash Koychai? He got upset because he didn't understand. Why? So you might say he wanted to understand the Shir. So why did he suddenly become content when he heard his name quoted? He still didn't understand what happened earlier. It seems like at first glance what upset him was that he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand. Suddenly when his name is quoted, Oh, finally, they quoted me. But this may, doesn't make sense. The Pasuk tells us, Va'ish Moshe, onav miyoyed mikal adam adam. Moshe was the humblest man on earth. So he didn't understand. And suddenly when he gets credit in Rabbi Akiva's shit, oh, now I'm happy. How do we understand this? The question is stronger. The Alter Rebbe explains, how is it possible that Moshe should be the humblest person on earth? Did he not know his great virtues? Did he not know who he was? So what does the Alter Rebbe tell us? That Moshe Rabbeinu knew who he was, but he felt that his tremendous accomplishments were the consequence of unique gifts and resources that were conferred upon him from above. And Moshe felt that if another human being would have been given the same gifts that he had, perhaps that individual would have maximized them to far greater levels and extents than Moshe has maximized them. And thus he walked around and he felt truly humble in the presence of everybody. I knew that he took the Jews out of Egypt, that he was appointed by Hashem to give the Torah, that he traveled with them and performed the miracles 40 years in the desert. True. But he felt this was not due to his own achievements. This was a gift from above. So if somebody else would have had these gifts, he would have accomplished the same great things. And perhaps he would have accomplished much more with the same koicha. So he really felt humble in the presence of every person. Because he said, if somebody would have had my milas, my gifts, my resources, my talents, <coughs> my capabilities, he might have ran with them far, much, he would, might have ran with them further than I ran with them and achieved even greater heights. So I have no reason to feel pompous or superior or arrogant. Now, Moshe never met that person. Moshe never met that person who was given the koiches that he had and took them further. Suddenly he meets that person, Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is giving a shade and Moshe doesn't understand. Here is the person. Here is the test. Here is the moment you always thought about. What's Moshe's response? Instead of celebrating it, Tashash He's perturbed. He can't come back to himself. Only when he's quoted, How do we understand this Gemara? What Moshe did not understand was something far more profound. So the Madrash Shmuel says, What's the Messina? Should have said, Moshe Kibotayra me Akadish Baruch Hu Masar Yeshua. What's the me Sinai? He received the Torah from Sinai, he received the Torah from Hashem, and he gave it to Yeshua. Yeshua Liskainen. <coughs> so the Mepharshim say the Madrashmul and other Mepharshim that Moshe Kibotayra me Sinai means that from Sinai, Moshe learned how to be Makabal Torah. We know that Sinai was Machich Mekal Teraya, the lowest of the mountains. So from Sinai, Moshe learned that the, pre- the prerequisite for Kabbalah Satayda, the prerequisite for accepting Teda is humility, humbleness, the exact antithesis of pompous arrogance and egotism. Moshe understood that the Yisoyda Yisoyda is the foundation of Kabbalah Satayda is the absolute abnegation of the ego of the person who's learning Torah. This is true about every wisdom. 
you must have humility to truly absorb it, but especially with Teda, because Teda is divine wisdom. And divinity, by definition, transcends the finite intellectual ego of the human being. So how can the I truly understand Teda, which is divine and thus infinite, and thus transcendent of my brain capacity? And the answer is, the prerequisite for true success in Teda is Bittl. When the person suspends his or her intellectual ego completely and they become total conduits and vessels to appreciate what God has to say through Teda, then only then can they be Kalim, can they become containers where the Teda will enter into them because they created an empty space, devoid of their ego. Maisha knew this is the side of Teda, Bittl, humility, humbleness. In order to be Zaycha, to be a merit, to be a channel for God, for godliness. The first thing that's necessary is to go beyond the ego. And suddenly, he sees Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is giving a shear. And Moshe looks at Rabbi Akiva and he listens to his words. And he knows that what Rabbi Akiva is communicating is Teda. It's Chachma Dikdusha. It's holy wisdom, it's teda, it's elokus, it's godliness. And yet he's absolutely dumbfounded. Because when he looks at Rabbi Akiva, what, is, what does he see? He sees... He sees... He sees Rabbi Akiva, an extraordinary orator. He sees in Rabbi Akiva a skilled communicator. He sees in Rabbi Akiva a charismatic teacher. He sees in Rabbi Akiva a brilliant mind, unparalleled scholarship. But he does not see in Rabbi Akiva the Anivas the humility, the sense of selflessness that he, Moshe, knows is the prerequisite for Torah. So Moshe Rabbeinu looks at Rabbi Akiva and what does he see? He sees extraordinary, powerful talent, wisdom, depth, innovation, brilliance, diction, communication skills. But he doesn't see in Rabbi Akiva the Talmud, the Chassid. Tashash Koychai. This makes my Rabbein weak. This is what he doesn't understand. How is it possible that Rabbi Akiva should be communicating Taylor without this quality of selflessness, of egolessness, that he does not recognize here in Rabbi Akiva's face? And we can take it a step deeper. Moshe Rabbeinu might have difficulty understanding some of the concepts Rabbi Akiva is conveying actually. But he senses that it's Torah and he wonders. How is it possible that Rabbi Akiva's al Zayn la shal Rabbi Akiva should communicate and should grasp the truth of Torah and even more than by Moshe Rabbeinu. In other words, through his powerful mind and comprehension skills, he can reach greater heights in Torah than through Moshe Rabbeinu's bittle and Kabbalah soil, Moshe Rabbeinu's selflessness and humility. This bothered Moshe. This wasn't a personal insult. I feel, I, I don't understand. This was something else. What bothered Moshe Rabbeinu is what is happening here. What happened to the Torah he knows so well about? Uh, and then, Rabbi Akiva reaches a point in the seer. <coughs> and his students turn to him and say, Rebbe, minayin loch. How do you know this? And Rabbi Akiva says three words. Halacha l'moshe l'seer. This I can't prove intellectually. But this is a tradition we have from Moshe Rabbeinu in Har Sinai. Nisyash Moshe Rabbeinu, calm down. Why? 
Here I must quote to you the original words of the Rebbe in Yiddish. What Moshe Rabbeinu saw was, El Hota Rebbe, Nesiyash When push comes to shove at a moment of truth, when Rabbi Akiva is challenged, what is his answer? Allah I don't need to prove it to you. I don't need to demonstrate its validity intellectually to you. Allah Moshe gave it over from our Sinai. Moshe saw that at the epicenter of Rabbi Akiva's mansion of ideas. At the epicenter of Rabbi Akiva's unparalleled talents and charisma and depth of scholarship. At the core, at the foundation, you can find whom and what? Allah Alamashim Sinai. So when he goes up to the mountain, Hashem tells him that Akiva ben Yosef is going to expound on each line. Till tilim shallah. Mounds upon mounds of Allah, mountains. But all the mountains can be traced back to Allah at the core of Rabbi Akiva. This calmed Moshe Rabbeinu. It soothed Moshe Rabbeinu. He understood that the Yisai, the foundation was here. Rabbi Akiva was first and foremost a student. Talmud, a chassid, he had a rabbi. But here, we have the opposite question. Torah demands from us not only absolute humility and abnegation of ego. Torah demands from us that we use our minds to understand, to inquire, to question, to discriminate between ideas, to analyze, to dissect the challenge. <clears throat> so how do we deal with these two notions? They seem so paradoxical. So Rashi continues, Rabbi Shema there is a difference between going into the Mikdash and remaining out of the Mikdash. Suya Yayin, drunk with wine, represents Kabbalistically and Hasidically, it represents being drunk, being intoxicated on the comprehension of Teda. <coughs> the Gemara says, the Mesechti Yerushalmi, the 10th chapter of Psachim that a princess met Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Loi, and she told him, your face is similar to the face of somebody who drank a lot of wine. And Rabbi Yehuda said, yes, my learning is with me constantly. He was so immersed in learning, he was so involved in learning. <coughs> His face seemed like the face of somebody who had drank and drank a lot. So wine represents the fact that the person understands, comprehends. Yayin in Kabbalah is always associated with Bina, with comprehension. Nichnes Yayin, when wine comes in, Yatza, side secrets come out. Yayin and Soit have the same gematria, 70. So when she looked at the princess, looked at Rabbi Yudha, Rabbi Loi, she saw somebody who looked drunk. and drink, you have to drink a lot. You have to learn, learn, and learn, and understand. There's only one problem. Don't go into the Beis HaMikdash. Mikdash, Beis HaMikdash represents davening. There are those moments in the day the human being got to stand in front of his creator without any clothes, without any ego, without any garments, without any understanding. Like a child in front of a father, in front of a mother, stripped from his intellectual identity, totally vulnerable, totally naked, without any garments and coverings, without any grace of and understanding. 
When you're sitting and learning, suye yayin, like Rabbi Yudha Rabbi Loi says. Just like when somebody is drunk, the ponim is faflamt, the face is burning from the effect of the alcohol. Spiritually, the face ought to be burning from the fire, the passion, understanding of learning. But nichnesul amikdash, when you go into the base amikdash, in front of the king, now it's not about you, it's not about your excitement, your passion, your understanding. Now it's totally about the king. Now you ought to strip yourself from everything and stand like an evid of the... The Gemara says, Avde Kame Mar, like a servant in front of his master, the Gemara in Shabbos Dafyut. And when you have the experience of the Beis Amigdosh, then even when you come out and you start drinking, you start learning, you use your mind, you still remain connected. Your mind remains aligned with the truth of God. You don't veer off. And that's the importance of davening in a person's life. Those moments when you totally connect. You go out of yourself and you connect to God. But here one asks the question. Ultimately, there's a paradox. If you celebrate your own identity and your own understanding, how can you truly celebrate your nothingness? And if you truly celebrate your nothingness, how can you come back and embrace your somethingness? So you're telling me it's two times. But even if it's two times, if one is true, how can you get yourself an hour later to be <coughs> so different? So here Rashi tells us, Marshal the Melech Shahayalai Ben Bayas. Because we're dealing with a Ben Bayas. If you weren't a Ben Bayas, indeed you can't combine a Belezer and a Bishmal. Either you're in a state of nothingness and you don't say a halacha in front of your Rebbe. Or you're in a state of somethingness and when you're outside of the Beis Amigdash and in you drink because you're something. But Mashal Lamelech Shahayoloi Ben Bayis. Ayid is a Ben Bayis Bamebrishtan. A Jew is in the home of Hashem, raised in the home, feels the home, experiences the home. So therefore, as a Ben Bayis, he could combine both. On one hand, celebrate his nothingness and on the other hand understand that he must use his personality or her personality his or her mind and maximize their potential in the service of Hashem and the learning of Torah and in the observance of mitzvahs since a Jew is a ben bias so there is that paradox in the relationship a child with parents on one hand there's a point where the child is in awe of a parent where the child is humbled in the presence of a parent. With a child, feels like a child. A child who has nothing of his own and was given everything in life by the parents. And yet, the very same child, if he grew up in a nurturing and functional and loving home, also understands the value of maximizing his own potentials beyond the father and beyond the mother. A Jew is a ben bayis by Mabrish, and Marshal Amalek Shahilay ben bayis. And thus he could combine both elements. There's the element of selflessness. Halacha Lamaisha Misina, where I don't exist. I just want to know the truth of Taylor. And I understand that a relationship with the Shekhinah needs a relationship with Maisha Rabbeinu. And on the other hand, the same Jew appreciates and understands <coughs> that the Shekhinah wants him to truly understand Torah, to truly internalize Torah within the confinements of his personality. That synthesis occurs, can occur, in the life of a Ben Bayes. Have a wonderful night.